I don't know if you've ever been seriously ill. And I personally thought of it as a good experience. <laughs> Let's just say, seemed like a good idea at the time. Oh, okay, well maybe it didn't, but now, looking back, of course, I think it was a good experience. Even at the time, to be honest, I was a born again Christian, so, you know, quite frankly, I was fine, you know, with it. I was just pretty confident that just like the doctor said, I wouldn't live past 30. So I'm pretty confident that, you know, pain and suffering and misery that I was in, because I was <clears throat> literally living inside the VA hospital most of the time for months at a time. And when you get to be living inside of a hospital, you become what's called institutionalized. You kind of fit in as a professional patient. You're just kind of one of the people that's always there you know you're dying or you're being taken care of and just kind of like get it over with you know but sooner or later you're just gonna check out and for me you know that was kind of the way my life was as an early born again Christian I was pretty much lost 10 years of my life in hospitals because I spent most of the time in hospitals and it was an interesting time because God gave me such appreciative awareness of certain aspects that I was seeing and he was applying so I could learn to use them in my life as a believer. Because, in case you didn't notice, I didn't die. Oh well, man, I thought I had that down. But you see, one of the things I learned in the hospital was you could watch and you could tell who was dying. You could see their pallor, their skin color changed. Their aura, which we can't see, but we do know that by electromagnetic, you know, these types of pictures that we can take, there's some kind of electrical charge or emanation that comes outside of our body because of all the electrical impulses that's going inside our body, that there's something around us, you know, and some people used to call it, you know, the soul picture, and that's not really what it is. But, you know, it sounds good, you know, it's kind of nice, and it's a good idea. You know, you could use it as an object lesson, as long as you don't try to use it as a factoid, because, quite frankly, that's not what it is. But anyways, it's a nice idea. But people that used to get into that, they would say there were different colors, meant different things, and kind of sounded good, you know, and the science of it wasn't quite caught up yet, so it always appeared to be like a good thing, you know, till later it was kind of disproven, but you could tell as a patient when you saw someone every day who was dying next, and we pretty much knew that, you know, there, in the VA hospital there used to be, especially Long Beach VA, used to be a lot of black nurses would come in, they were big black nurses, and you don't mess around no black nurse because you know what, she tell you what for and where to go, <laughs> in the VA that is, and so they would come in and they always had a sense of humor. They thought it was funny, you know, they'd just be doing their thing, you know, ah, Joe's going to die next week, it's just, you know, and we just, you know, because of the military, we kind of had a sense of humor that might have been a little off color in some ways, but was pretty much right on in other ways. You knew who was going to die next, because it looked like it. Greg Castleberry and I were two sides of the opposite coin, or same coin. He was a man who had an incurable disease and was told he would probably live. And I was a man who had an incurable disease and was told I would probably, well, told I would die. Yeah. No doubt about it. And we were both going through the same surgery the same day, pretty much. He went in for, you know, a proctoileocolectomy, which means that they cut out all his guts, you know, most of them. And I went in for a proctoileocolectomy, and they cut out all my guts. For him, it was a solution for his ulcerated colitis. He would no longer have that problem with his disease, but he would suffer greatly going through the recovery process because it's, it's pretty intense surgery. Me, mine was just like a temporary solution to a bad, <laughs> bad scenario getting worse. But hey, you know, it was like interesting.
we were lying in bed. One across from the other. You know, he was a, I believe he was in the Army or Navy, I'm not sure, and I was in the Marine Corps. But we were lying in bed recovering, you know, and we couldn't move because we had our guts cut open, you know, our stomach, our belly was just like stitched shut, you know, with these staples, you know, and it was like, if we dare move, it hurt. But, you know, being young men that we were, because we were in our teens or 18s and 19s or 20s, something like that, we also had a sense of humor, so we would tease each other to make each other laugh because it hurt. So we'd get to laughing, and it would just hurt. Then the nurses would come in, and or the nurses' aides, or the you know whatever they were. You want to say janitorial, but they were nurses' aides, I guess. You know, in the VA, it's kind of hard to tell what they were. But they'd come in, you know, to make the beds, you know, and they would get us laughing, you know, and we'd be crying and laughing at the same time because we're trying to hold our stitches in. So we'd be grabbing ourselves and holding our pillows over our stitches and holding our sides in because. Quite frankly, if we laughed hard enough, we'd blow our stitches and our guts would blow out. <laughs> Imagine that, you know, laughing so hard that you laughed your guts out. Isn't there an expression like that? <laughs> well, there was also another gentleman that was across the, the beds. We had like six, well, maybe one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, maybe eight beds per dorm. And... He was pretty much across from us, and it was an elderly gentleman. You know, he was older, and, you know, he was told, you know, that he was dying, you know, and he had this kind of, like, gray pallor, and you could tell that, you know, he wasn't going to make it much longer. You know, as a matter of fact, the nurses that I told you about, and they came in, they said, man, he ain't got 48 hours, you <laughs> know, and by golly, When Greg and I both showed up recovering from surgery after we got out of intensive care, you know, we still had tubes in our noses and all that. But anyway, that's another story. Oh man, you want to want to lead me around by the nose? <laughs> Just put a tube in my nose. <laughs> but the point is, is that Greg and I were always cutting up and laughing up. You know, we were always like having fun. We were, even though I was dying and told I would die, and he was told he would live, and we were suffering greatly. We pretty much enjoyed the fact that the reality of our existence didn't take down the perspective of our humor. You know, just because I was dying didn't mean I couldn't laugh. And just because he was suffering didn't mean he couldn't laugh. As a matter of fact, we laughed a lot. We enjoyed laughing. And so, once we got into that dorm, the man across from us, I, I think it was Mr. Smith, but I can't seem to remember and uh, he began to improve. We were laughing and he began to look better. At first it was just slightly different. You know, he, he kind of like, instead of laying deep in his bed pillows, he seemed to kind of like lean forward a little bit, you know. Then slowly he began to use his, ask the nurse to, as a matter of fact we didn't have remote control, so he asked the nurse to roll up the end of his bed because we had roll up beds. So he brought his bed up, you know, and so he would sit up and watch us in action. His power began to change. As a matter of fact, day after day while we were there, he began to improve. While we were there, he even began to eat. He started eating soft food. The doctors were shocked. They were amazed. They couldn't figure it out. The guy should have died over a week ago, and yet every day he was getting better. And we were recovering, and we were doing better ourselves. As a matter of fact, it was interesting because we kept getting stronger, and so did he. He seemed to be recovering in ways that the doctors couldn't explain. And the family would come in and they were they had made arrangements, you know, and you know that, you could tell by the conversation. <laughs> and they were like, wow, and he, I, he never spoke to us, and we never spoke to him. But it was amazing to watch the transformation from dying to living. Once we recovered, we left. Two days later, he died. It was interesting for me because Chuck Smith gave a teaching on rats you know they put rats in the water you know and they they kind of like pull them out before they drown you know and they put them back in the water and pull them out before they drown you know he's got it's a very old Chuck Smith teaching but basically it talks about hope hope deferred or hope hope you know what hope can do for you and the teaching makes you appreciate the fact that these rats when they were put in water the first time and no one touched them, they drowned within an hour. But when you kept pulling the rat out before it drowned, 
when you finally left it in there, it stayed alive for 23 hours, if I remember right, because it hoped to be rescued. It had that expectation to be saved. You see, it had hope, and hope is something that can give you the strength and ability to look forward to and have something to look forward to with a confident expectation of faith, placing your trust in what you don't know, and God adds to it what he does know and causes you to be saved. And the reality of Mr. Smith was that he was recovering as long as we were there. He had hope. He had a purpose. He had a reason to live. And when we left, he lost his reason to live. And even the nurses to this day talk about it. You know, they, they said, yeah, you know, once those guys are gone, you know, he died, you know, just like he's supposed to. You know, they, they're kind of like, you know, one attitude about it. But my realization that I learned from it was that we have the ability to give each other hope. We have the confident strength of our convictions as well as the faith that God has given us and placed within our heart to offer and proffer to the world hope for their salvation. They can live a little longer and possibly be rescued from the situation and circumstances they're in to come to the realization of Jesus Christ and be saved for eternity. We can offer that hope. But you see, if we don't offer that hope, then the world will perish. The world will fail. The world will become worse than what it already is. We are the hope of the world. We're the hope of our calling is placed assured in the knowledge that Jesus is changing us. But the realization of people watching us is they hope you are a Christian. To him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Look, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five more. And his Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you rule over many. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or whether it be bad. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all of them who also love his appearing. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. The enemy of our faith wants to rob, to steal, to destroy. And the way that he robs is to steal our joy, to steal our peace, to steal our hope of our calling. The hope of your calling is the knowledge and the realization that you have salvation. Your profession of faith is the declaration to the entire universe that Jesus has done it. He has paid the price for your sin. You've already been purchased. You're already paid for. You're bought, paid for, and sealed with that redemptive price that God has placed His Spirit in you. But if you only leave that alone without ever growing or sharing or telling others about it, I question whether or not that salvation is a realization of that process that God has brought into your life to cause you to be saved or you're just one of those that are unprofitable servants that the Lord says depart from me I never knew you you see the world wants us not to fail in our testimony but they want to see if God is real in what we say in what we speak in what we do and how we act it is always about knowing in a personal way not faith-based, not grace-based, but intimacy realization of God in you so that the world may see and know that Jesus is alive. That he's not just alive in me and you're singing wonderful songs, but that there's something different. You have a hope when everyone else doesn't. You have a confidence when everything else is falling apart. You have the strength to laugh in the face of death. For it has no sting, and there is nothing that you fear now, 
except to bring glory and honor to your Father in heaven in the way that you die, not if you die. That you want to do all you can with every moment you have left, with every breath that you take, with every move that you make, with all that you say that you love someone with. You can demonstrate that love for God as the world demonstrates its love or lust for each other. You see, it's not about condemning or commending what someone is doing. It's about living what you say you believe in. When you have hope, when you have faith, when you have love, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. You won't be fearful by night, by the terrors in the night, or the terrors in the day, or the traps that are laid, or the snares, or the topics, or the words, or the court cases, or the confrontations that you go through in life. You won't worry about the gang member that's next door, the people screaming on the street. You won't worry about whether heaven or hell has come to meet you today. The only thing that you'll have is an internal peace that passes all understanding. Because you know Jesus, and Jesus knows you.